thank you for sticking around. I realized on the flight coming here, the last time I was actually in Asia, is quite a while ago, uh, I was not just the founding, but still the acting president of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And um, it is great to see the level of progress that we have seen today in terms of the political awareness for why software freedom and open standards matter so much. So for myself, I then moved on into the business realm of things and particularly Collab Systems, which I have been founding and heading since 2010. And the reason for that is that I was looking for the next greatest big challenge um, and trying to find something meaningful and important. And the, re the reactions to my choosing collaboration technologies, or you know, what also old fashioned, also often called groupware, were very mixed. Because some people said, isn't that actually a solved problem? Yet at the same time, even today, I'm getting comments of the kinds, I didn't even know such a system existed that was actually free software or open source. Um, because all, virtually all the other systems out there are typically proprietary, often open core, um, and very often not up to the level of functionality that we require if we actually want to penetrate the big field. I mean, I'm not talking about everyone running this at home who is a free software lover. I'm talking about everyone running this. I'm talking about 7 billion users, hypothetically. And if we want to reach that level, we need technology that can actually play at that field. So the little challenge that I was looking at was, let's try to find out whether we can build this. Now, collaboration. Let's see whether this works. Stefan, you like to be. Let's try that again. Let's do it old fashioned. I got let down by the city of Munich, oh no. Um, collaboration. Collaboration is an essential human need. It is something that all of us experience daily and that most of us have by now fortunately grown up with. It is also the one thing that if it doesn't work, people are willing to make almost any compromise to re-establish it, um, which is a problem because you see, when we talk about collaboration and when we talk about confidence, we live in a day and age where that confidence is somewhat damaged, to say the least. Um, we have the problem that we cannot really trust a lot of the technologies that are out there. And, I mean, yes, we have learned a whole lot more about the details about this, but a lot of the fundamentals were known for a long time and the issues of software dependency and lack of transparency and lack of ability to understand the software and control the software that then controls your lives have been known for a long time. In fact, well, the free software movement has been talking about these issues for a very long time. It's only that it's perhaps never been so dramatically clear why it is so important. Now, if we want to collaborate with ease and confidence, um, then the question becomes, what are the necessary prerequisites? What is the puzzle piece that we require to establish that kind of technology? What is it that we need to be able to do? What are we looking at? And first and foremost, also, how do we reconcile these two very different goals of security and ease of use and full functionality? Um, because very often security is gained at leaving away functionality. So adding functionality very often is a challenge to security. Now, there's a bunch of principles that we thought should be applied to this problem. So, first of all, let's see whether this at least works. No, that's not. I think it's dead. Um, let's try this. Aha, uh -huh, here we are. Good. So, first of all, security is in the middle. Why is it in the middle? As we have heard earlier today, you 
cannot retrofit security. It is impossible. If you are not thinking about security from the onset, you cannot slap it on later. It's not some magic fairy dust that you've put over an application at the end. It is something that needs to be central to your thinking from when you start developing from the start. From your architectural perspective, you need to think about it first. Then, in order to achieve the actual level of trust, we need openness. There can be no secrets. It must be fully transparent, fully open, fully studyable, and you can take it apart in any way you want. And you can put it back together in any way that fits you. Only something that meets that can actually ever be trustworthy. I'm not saying just because it is, it's trustworthy, but it's the prerequisite. It is necessary. It should be working because we live in a heterogeneous world and as much as we would like it, perhaps Windows is not going away, nor is a lot of other platforms. It must be able to work on all platforms. It must be scalable because we have more and more users coming in and we will have always situations where you know, large data centers, large companies should be running this and that means hundreds of thousands of users in some cases, millions of users in others. Um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions perhaps, you need something that can possibly scale up and provably scale up to that region. And of course it needs to have the features because um, users are attracted by features more than anything else and they expect certain capabilities, they want to be able to do certain things, otherwise um, using the solution feels too much like a penance and not necessarily something they want to do, and even if they start grudgingly use it because they know they should, um, unless you give them what they need to get the job done, they won't be using it for long. Again, collaboration and communication technologies are not something that are, is optional. I mean, it's essential for virtually anyone on this planet and definitely every business. Now, the solution we built is built on those principles and that premise. Um, so Colab has the full fledged of features, right? So there's email, of course, calendar and contacts, it has a file cloud module, it has tasks and notes, and it has semantic connections between those. So you can, for instance, add a note to an email. From the note that you have created, you can jump back to the email. Um, even if you've moved the email to another folder, things like that, you can tag your objects um, and you can you know, connect things in various ways, including having a you know, task-based email workflow. You can translate emails to calendar events or tasks in your inbox. You can share those tasks with your colleagues. You can delegate a task by email. The entire space of functionality that you would expect is there. But since this is a technical conference, I also wanted to show you containers. Um, now, each of these containers shows you a little bit about how we are achieving this and how we are achieving this at scale. And I apologize that it's a bit complex, but uh, unfortunately, this is not an easy problem to solve. Now, every single box in this diagram here represents an actual functional unit, a service that you know, traditionally was often put into some virtual machine, in the container world is put into an atomic um, box and then run and scaled out and clustered in any way you require it. Um, the grouping is um, a little bit like from the less trusted to the more trusted and also up here these are web application firewalls, HA proxy, these are commonly used, but we don't necessarily consider them part of our solution. Yet, of course, we use them ourselves in deployments, and so do our customers, um, and a lot of our users. And not just here, by the way, you can in principle use these also in the middle, because every single of these components is talking to every single other service component over networked protocols that you can fully secure all the way to PFS. Um, so you can have a fully encrypted data center where even a network sniffer gives you absolutely nothing despite all these components talking to each other um, very, very much um, because you can actually lock it down enough to do that. 
Now, every single of these components itself can be clustered. Um, and you see things here like the Colab Web application. This you might know as a lightweight version um, under the name of Roundcube, because we've been developing Roundcube for the past years. The primary Roundcube developers are Colab Systems um, employees and even shareholders, in fact. Um, and they, with us, have worked to build the web application that you get now with Colab, um, along with, with several other services as well. Um, so this is a very easy to use web application. We have some web assets that we serve for all applications. We have a dev server, so for CalDev, CarDev, WebDev, that allows you to hook up your Mac books natively, your Android phones. Um, there's a lot of um, devices and machines that consume DAF protocols, but for the uh, Microsoft side, we also have an Active Sync server in there. So your iPhones, um, your iPads, uh, all of those work extremely well over Active Sync. In fact, we even support this global address list feature, so you can query your LDAP server um, from the phone live as you go along and find it as part of the address book, even though it's not synchronized to the phone. There's the file cloud module, which also supports multiple backends. So you can hook this into C file, you can store your files in IMAP, you can add your own backends if you want. All of this easily possible. Um, you have a web admin that actually um, talks against the um, admin API, which allows you to administrate the entire server through a RESTful protocol, ultimately. Um, and the admin is a web interface that only exposes the features to the user that correspond to the actual permissions that this user has. You have client auto configuration, so when a Thunderbird connects up to the server, it gets the correct you know, settings for its actual mail and so on and so forth. And um, if you're running a uh, hosting provider, we have a customer configuration panel that allows you to run a multi-tenant installation out of one scalability. So, I mean, it's one installation, but it's multi-tenant capable. And that allows customers to actually administrate their own boxes and administrate whatever you know, product boxing you may have defined in there. All of this is um, the, the, the service layer. Um, essentially based around um, HTTP, so the part that we trust the least because it's the most closest to the actual internet and the user. Um, and we have a service infrastructure here that supports that. What is important to understand is that we have a uh, payload central, you should say, um, because Colab has been um, one of the NoSQL um, pioneers in terms of principles. Colab has been using IMAP as a NoSQL database back in 2003 when it was first conceived. That sounds very weird in the beginning to some people who hear it for the first time, but we're using the RFC 5464 metadata standard to then identify the folders so the clients know what they are looking at and store all the data in XML-based um, RFC compliant um, files, so you can actually scale this down to files on disk or in some key value store, any kind of storage in the backend ultimately that you feel like. Um, you can connect almost any level of scalability to this, and if you can scale it in IMAP, you can scale it in Cola, because everything else is replicatable. And you just throw as many at the problem as you require. Then we have a mail exchanger. Um, this here contains a component called Wallace, which allows you to define auto invitation policies, handle mails in certain ways, also attach signatures to outgoing email, all sorts of additional functions. You have an audit train and e-discovery system, which actually allows you to answer the question of what happened to my calendar event, who edited it, and when, who deleted it. These kind of questions are very common. So you have a very comprehensive system that is clearly meant for a large enterprise because they need to adopt it if we ever to win this whole battle. But it runs on Raspberry Pi if you need it to. We have community members who port it and run it on a Raspberry Pi. And um, I mean, it can't serve a million users on a Raspberry Pi, of course. Um, however, it runs. And it runs stable enough for a small deployment. On our roadmap, just briefly, is Mapi server, so you can connect all your old outlooks. 
Um, then, of course, the instant messaging, a voice video. Um, we have data loss prevention features right now under construction, which will allow us to also enable this in um, the more sensitive realms that want to make sure that no data gets lost. And we have configuration management, storage, monitoring, orchestration kind of containers and quite a bit of knowledge there. Just very briefly, ease of use, this by the way is how the web client looks. Um, so you see you know, your email list. I have, don't have a million screenshots here now, so um, don't worry. Um, but you see it's a very clean, easy to use skin. Um, this is also um, what the city of Munich will be looking at um, fairly soon if um, the project of the migration goes successful. But it looks rather good right now because we are the next stage of the Linux project in a way. We are now moving in to replace the old Oracle calendaring solution and the old mail server that apparently cannot handle certain subject lines um, and make sure that there is no more bad press about that. Um, and among our users are also Fortune 50, which I unfortunately cannot mention, some ASPs, ISPs. Um, the German Federal Office for IT Security initially tendered the solution um, and initially actually um, had called up developed. They are running it until today. Um, it's a small deployment, just 500 desktops, but a fairly important one because for them, back in 2003, it being free software, it being open standards, it being fully auditable, was a necessary requirement for them to trust it. Back in 2003, um, that was actually rather smart. They were, by the way, also the first federal agency in the world that I know of that funded free software, namely GNU-PG. Um, we have the schools of Basel, and hopefully soon we will also see your Raspberry Pi on that list. Um, all of this only works if it's professional and supported. That is what we do. Collab Systems is partnering with virtually all the platforms out there, including Red Hat, where we are an advanced ISV. And um, that allows us to actually then put it professionally into production because running a large deployment without support isn't really possible. And that's all I have for you. Grab me. I'm around the next days. Um, here are some more URLs for you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions?